sitting with is Buell Wesley Fraser. And he has a unique position in history, today being the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. Buell had a significant role in the history of that day, 50 years ago today. Tell us about that morning. Where did you work? Uh, I was employed by Texas School Book Depository in Dallas, Texas. How long did you work there? I worked there from September of 1963 until the end of August of uh, 1965. Your home was originally in Huntsville, Texas? Uh, that's where I grew up. That's where you grew up. I was born, I was born in uh, a little town called Highlands, Texas. It's in Harris County. It's real small. Near Houston? Yes. And you found your way up to Dallas because your sister lived in Dallas. That is correct. Okay. And your sister at the time, in 1963, was married to Bill. And your sister was Lenny Mae Randall. That is correct. And they had three daughters. Yes. And along comes Uncle Buell, or back then it was Uncle Wes. Oh, uh, well, they, um, the family, I have a nickname, it's called Bubba. Bubba. And uh, so I was Uncle Bubba, and, and of course these three little uh, nieces I had, they were like really like little sisters to me. Uh, that's what they told me as they got older. We always uh, considered you our big brother, even though technically you were, uh, you were our uncle. Yeah, but back in 1963, you were only a 19-year-old kid. That is correct. I was a young 19 years old back in uh, November the 22nd of 1963. And you slept on the couch? Yes, at my sister's and, and her husband's house, yes. November the 22nd, um, it was a Friday, and um, it was a typical Friday, just like any other, but this was uh, not a typical day. Uh, on this particular day, um, Lee was... Um, Who's Lee? Lee Oswald. Uh, Lee had uh, ridden out to um, Irving, Texas with me on Thursday, November the 21st. Now you knew Lee because you worked with him. Yes, I did know Lee. He was five years older than you were at the time. Uh, yes, I believe that's correct. And... Uh, he had ridden out with me on Thursday afternoon. He, his, uh, the um, normal uh, arrangement we had was that he would ride out with me on Friday afternoon to visit his family, which lived a half a block up the street from me. And with, West 5th Street in Irving. Yes, and uh, his family lived with a lady by the name of Miss Ruth Payne. And uh, I would drop him off there in Irving in front of the house. and, and he, I would not see him anymore until Monday morning. We never did anything together. Uh, there's lots of people who say, well, uh, they've come in my donut shop for coffee and donuts. Uh, well, we've seen them out at the rifle range together. All that's totally false. There's, not a, uh, there's no truth to that. Uh, but on this, um, so he had written I, out to me. Why are you me. for saying that? I, I, I like the fact that you're saying that, but why, why are you saying that? You say there's no truth to that. You mean he was never at the rifle range? No, the truth is what I'm saying is not any truth to that, is that he and I were together at the donut shop or the rifle range. We never well, went people in. People are saying they saw you with him at the rifle range. They saw you with him at the donut shop. Yes. Uh, what he would do on the weekends with his family, I, I don't know because <clears throat> there he had a young wife and two children. And um, I wanted him to have all the time that he could with his family because sure. during the week he lived in Dallas and he had a room over at a, board, uh, at a boarding house on Beckley. Um, so when Lee would leave work on uh, a Monday afternoon through Thursday, I do not know where he would go or who he talked to or, or any of his routine. I didn't know anything about that. You only knew him from the job inside the school book depository. That's right. Okay. And we worked very closely together. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the first day I met Lee was uh, the day that uh, he came to work at October the Texas School Book. October 15th, 1963. What day was it? October 15th, 
Okay. That was the day he got the job. He came to work that day, and that was the first day that you ever saw him, the first day you ever met him. You didn't even know his last name. That is correct, because when Mr. Shelley, my supervisor, introduced me to him, he said, this is Lee. And uh, he said, he's going to be working with us. And he says, I want you to take him and teach him how to fill orders as well as you. And uh, so that was my job. And um, uh, Lee was a very good worker. Uh, the thing I, li I liked about him was that he learned quickly. He wasn't a slacker. He was a hard worker. And he was nice and courteous to me. And I enjoyed my time with him uh, there at the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, but going back to November the 22nd, he had ridden out with me the night before, which was a Thursday on November 21st, and I asked him, I said, well, where do you want to go to Irving on Thursday? I said, you always go with me on Friday. And he said, well, Marina's made me some curtains and that I'm going to go out to Irving. There's some, they have some curtain rods out there, and I'm going to get the curtain rods and uh, take them back with me on Friday and I'll take them and put the uh, curtains up in my apartment. So I said, fine. So the you next- You had no reason to disbelieve that story? No, uh, that is co correct. He ne I didn't have any uh, right to doubt what he told me. And um, so the next morning, uh, Friday, November 22nd, was a little unusual uh, because he had gotten up and walked down to the house where I lived with my sister and her husband and three children. And uh, he had a package with him. And the package, uh, uh, he uh, placed in the back seat of my car on the passenger side. My sister did see him walk across the street and she heard the car door open up so she knew he put the package in there. She heard the car door slam and then he walked over and looked in the window but she had looked out just a, a few seconds earlier, uh, witnessed him uh, walking across the street with the package. Well, he looks in the window. Excuse me, you saw him walk across the, with the package? I did not see him walk, my sister did. Oh, she saw, okay. And so, because um, I was at the breakfast table eating breakfast with my little nieces. Yeah. And my mother was there drinking coffee, sitting at the table drinking coffee. She happened to be visiting. Yes, she was visiting, my mother was visiting along with my stepfather, who had had a heart attack, and he was in the hospital there in Irving. Um, so my mother looks up, and she sees this guy um, looking in the window, and it startles her, and she says, Who is that man? And I said, Where? She said, The window. And I looked up, and Lee was looking in the window. And so I said, Oh, that's Lee. He works with me over in Dallas. And I said, He rides to work with me. So I go, I get up from the table and I go to the back door and open the back door, which I, uh, empties in, uh, opens. Uh, when you walk through the back door, you'd be out on the carport. And he was standing there and I said, Lee, I just about finished my breakfast. I said, would you like to come in and have a cup of coffee? He says, no. He says, um, I'll just stay out here. He says, I know you won't be long. So I, I closed the door and, and uh, had gone back to the table and I finished eating my breakfast, which was just a couple of bites. And uh, then I get up from the table and I go brush my teeth and I come back into the den uh, kitchen area where we were sitting at the table and my sister was just finishing up my lunch. I always took my lunch. I did that every day I worked there except just one or two times. And then I'd walk to a uh, local uh, sandwich shop was just a couple of blocks away. You could sit down and eat your sandwich. Well, where was it? Up Elm Street? Was it along Elm? Was it the sandwich shop was? No, this sandwich shop was down in what they now call the West End. West End back on Houston. You want yeah, back, back off of Houston Street. Uh, because you could go out the back of the school book depository or out the dock and walk down the steps and uh, walk across Houston and go over Is down that in. Is the way you left the building when you would normally go home to? down the back loading dock steps? Yes. Okay. Uh, but, um, so, when I opened the door when, and I had my lunch with me and uh, walked out onto the carport and Lee was standing there, we walked together to get in the car to go to work and uh, as I was sitting down, I glanced over my shoulder because I was talking to him and I saw a 
package on the back seat. Uh, I had seen a package on my back seat. And uh, so I said, well, what's in the package, Lee? He says, curtain rods. He said, don't you remember we talked about that yesterday? I said, yes, we did. And I said, and we never talked about the package anymore that day between he and I. We never had. Now, let me ask you a question about that package. In your job at the School Book Depository, you did have a machine that you used for wrapping paper, brown wrapping paper. Yes. Was there one machine or more than one? Well, uh, what the um, what the rolls were on a, uh, we had a device that you put the uh, roll of paper on and you could take and pull it out for whatever length you wanted. One and, machine or more than one? Uh, we had, uh, we one had. On each floor or just one downstairs? No, we had them, they were on the packing table. Over there, we had uh, two sides of the packing table, and they had a roll of paper on each side of the Is that packing. Is back by the loading dock, or where would that be? It was pretty close to the uh, loading dock. Okay. So there wasn't one on the second floor. There wasn't one on the no. third floor. It was the one downstairs, two rolls each side of the table, and you could use that. Yes. Do you remember what color the paper was? Yes, it was brown, light oh. brown. Light brown. Now, the paper wrapper you saw on the back seat of your car, was it identical or was it different from the paper that you used in the school book depository? Um, it was very similar. But was it identical? But that I don't know because in order to say it's identical, then you would have to take and do a test on it to see if it matched. Okay, but in your mind, see the reason I'm asking is, did Lee take paper home from the school book depository and use that for the curtain rods the next day? Did you happen to see any of that uh, paper Thursday night? Did he take yeah. paper home with him? Not to, not to my knowledge. I've been asked that before because if he had paper right. inside his jacket, walk around, you'd hear it crinkling. The paper would even You go. didn't see any of that? You didn't hear no. any crinkling? No. What was he wearing the night you took him home from the school book deposit? Just uh, ordinary... Uh, Clothes like he would wear to work and a jacket. He wore a t-shirt and then he, uh, an outer shirt over that? Uh, yes, that's what most of the time he, he, he wore. Now, sometimes um, he and Billy Lovelady, would, they would get hot, so they'd pull their jackets or their shirts off and just work in their white round neck t-shirts. T-shirt, okay. So you didn't see any paper that was carried on his person going home that night? That is correct. When I sat down in the car, I noticed he had a package, and I asked him what it was, and he told me it was curtain rods, and we never talked about it. That morning now, it was an overcast day. Uh, <laughs> a little it, bit like uh, today? Yes. It was overcast, and it was misting rain. We'll find the, the uh, dots of rain on the windshield was like the size of a needle or a straight pin. Very fine. And back in those days, we didn't have... Uh, cars with intermittent wipers. So I had to turn the wipers on and turn them off. And uh, I said on the way to work, I said, well, I wish it just rain or stop this. Well, it did it all the way to work. And on the way to work, uh, we listened to the radio like we always did. And the main reason I had the radio on, the station I had it on, was that if there was an accident between where I lived in Irving to where I was employed in Dallas, it would tell you what the location was and then you could detour around uh, to keep being avoided in a delay. Right. And um, there was no mention of the president coming to Dallas that day. Matter of fact, the first time that I really learned about the president coming to Dallas was after I got to work and a man I worked with uh, by the name of uh, Junior Jarman, uh, the way he got to work was uh, he, had, uh, he would ride the bus and every morning on the way between his home and work he would buy a newspaper. And in the newspaper article it, it showed that uh, the uh, parade was going to come right by, the motorcade was going to come right by the building. And so he told me, he said, look here, I want to show you this. And so I said, and he showed me and I said, I say. He says, well, uh, Junior was real excited about it. He said, do you think we'll get to go out and uh, see the parade? And I said, I don't know, Junior. I said, I just work here. I said, I don't make decisions like that. But uh, 
So after he talking with some other employees, they kind of nominated me to go ask Mr. Shelley, our supervisor, and I did. Um, Mr. Shelley was walking by and I said, Mr. Shelley, I have a question for you. And he says, what's that? I said, I understand from looking at the paper that Junior brought this morning that the uh, motorcade president, uh, presidential motorcade is going to come right by the building. And I said, are we going to be allowed to go out and watch that? And he says, well, I'll have to check. So he went to his boss, Mr. Truly, and Mr. Truly went upstairs to Mr. Kaysen, who's was who was everyone's boss in that building, regardless who they worked for, uh, what publisher or anything. He was the top person. So it was decided that at 12 o'clock we would stop, we'd cease work, and people would be able to go out and watch the uh, presidential motorcade come by the building. And, uh, and we did that. And um, I was standing on the top of the steps, uh, back in the shadows, there's pictures have been taken of that many times uh, and, and photos have been looked at the people that you could see there. But I was back up in the shadows, you couldn't see me. And talking about the Altkins photo in particular, the very famous photograph of the front steps during the assassination. Yes, and when we first got out there, uh, I'm a little taller than uh, Bill Shelley and, and Billy Lovelady. So Billy was trying to see, like, you know, like looking between somebody's armhole and standing up on his tiptoes, uh, trying to see. And I said, Billy, I said, won't you just go right down there on the front step, at the bottom steps? And I said, right there. And I said, there'll be no one in front of you and you'll, be able, you'll have a good view. And so he looked at me and he says, he said, thanks, Wes. He said, Wes, he said, I, I'm going to do that. So he, Did he do it? Yes, he did. Did you see him do it? Yes. And after he got there, at, on what, the bottom step or on the ground? Well, ground he was, level. He was uh, ground if, level. if you look at the picture, you can see Billy standing out there like he's holding up the wall. Right. And, and afterwards he told me, he says, that was a good idea. He says, I had a great view. And I said, well, back there standing with me, you, wouldn't, you couldn't have uh, seen. And I said, you'd been very unhappy. And... Uh, so the presidential motorcade goes by, and but when they're turning off of Houston Street onto Elm, is a real hairpin turn there. Right. So the uh, car had to really slow down, and I was the lady was standing next to me. Her name is Sarah, and she worked for one of the uh, one of the publishing offices. And I and I turned to uh, Sarah and I said, "Look at that! Look at her! How beautiful she is!" and I've often been amazed by the photography work of the photographers for Life and Look magazine back in 1963. I wonder what they could do with the technology advancements that we have today. Oh. But their, but their uh, photography was just impeccable. When the motorcade was coming down Houston Street, before they made the turn, it was being led by some motorcycle police. And they were cutting their motorcycles on and off and making them backfire. And when the motorcade turned the hairpin turn, that I got such a great view of um, Jackie and the president, and then they uh, went toward the uh, further down Elm. Well, they were out of my sight then because there was people standing on the curbs. Uh, and shortly after it turned, I heard I heard a, a, a sound, and it sounded like at first. It sounded like it was a motorcycle backfire, but then by the when the second and third uh, shot, then I realized that we wouldn't, I wasn't listening to a motorcycle backfire anymore. It was someone actually firing some type of a firearm. Well, if you thought the first one was a motorcycle backfire, you're standing directly beneath that sixth floor window that we're told Oswald was firing from. Did you honestly believe that there was a motorcycle up on the sixth floor? No. Then what does that mean to you by thinking it's a motorcycle backfire? Well, they were doing that before they made the turn. And so logically, a lot of people that has been interviewed and asked, they thought the first shot was a motorcycle backfire, but it wasn't. Uh, if you look at Dealey Plaza, it's closed on three sides and open on one side. 
and according to the type of year, like in November when the wind can really be swirling, uh, there's people that said there was more than three shots. But there actually all there was was three shots because of the sound ricocheting off one building and another. And I think that's where some people are confused that there was more than three shots. There was only three shots. Um, what was the source of those shots? Where were they coming from? Above you? Well, as I said, the wind swirling sometimes can, and the sound ricocheting off buildings can play tricks on your ears. So are you uh, saying you can't tell where it's coming from? Or well, that you do know where it was coming from because you weren't fooled by the wind? Because you know Dealey Plaza. Well, the thing is, the first shot I thought came from the right. But now, knowing what I know now and when the way the wind and the ricocheting of the sounds off the building, but the second and third shot sound much closer. But again, that's the way the wind was blowing and, rick and the sound ricocheting off the uh, buildings. Um, you could have a debate about that yeah. for, for days. People telling you uh, are, are asking, uh, but it was um, just due to that time of year and the way the wind were blowing and uh, so forth. It you was didn't get to see then the president during the assassination because you were blocked by other people. Yes. Okay. It was out of my view because if you have the opportunity to go and stand on the top of the steps back where I was standing in the shadows, you can see you only got a certain amount you can see. And after it gets past that, you can't see anything. Right. Well, let me ask you this then, what you could see. You could see Lee Harvey Oswald leaving your car after you parked your car to go to work that morning. I did. What did you see when you saw Lee get out of the car? Well, first he, he got out of the car and he stood there for a minute waiting because we always walk together. But this morning I was trying to uh, put a, make sure my battery had enough charge in it that it would start. You were running the radio. You, you were operating the windshield well, wipers. Yeah, well, I turned the wipers off and the radio off when okay. I was doing this. Because the reason I say this, because back in those days, cars had uh, generators and voltage regulators. Now that's all built into one unit called an alternator. And if uh, and I'd had some problems with my car, the uh, points what sticking. What kind of car did you have? I had a 54 Chevy. 54 Chevy. Is that uh, still in the garage today? You still got it? No. no. I wish I had. <laughs> I know you do. So I, I do too. I, I, I wish I had, but I, I don't have that. Um, I've been told that it's uh, down in San Antonio at Ripley's, believe it or not. Yeah, we'll go visit it someday. Was it a two-door or four-door? It's a four-door. Now, when Lee put the package in the back seat, you didn't see him do that? No, I did not see him do that. But when he got out to go to the school book depository, did you see him open up the back door and take the package out? Um, I did not see him, but I did hear him open the back door and he got the package. Well, he stood outside there, and then when he realized, as I said, that what I was doing, Lee turned around and started walking toward the... Uh, school book depository where we were employed. Well, how do you know that? You see him? Yes, okay. I did see him. And as you watched him walk away from you towards the school book depository, you were a good distance away from the school book depository. Yes. Several hundred yards away. Well, um, some people might say yards, and some people might say meters. Okay, um, you tell me. It, I, I, would, I would say it's, uh, it was a good 250 meters probably. Uh, from the parking lot where I had parked my car because that was the employee parking lot. Now, there was places to park up by the building, but that was for people like Mr. Shelley and Mr. Truly and Mr. Kaysen. The uh, bosses. Yes, the management. Okay. Uh, and the employee parking lot was down there where I had to park. Across the tracks. Yes. there was. Uh, people have to understand, now if you come to Dallas, there's uh, the... Uh, tracks are no longer there. There's parking lots. There's buildings that have been built since then, but the east, but the uh, office where the uh, where they uh, put the trains together, where the management here was on duty as a supervisor Lee there. Bowers, the Lee Bowers Tower. Yes, it's still there, but there was a lot of tracks, and uh, they were all the time switching and putting trains together and dropping cars and taking on cars, and. I used to watch it every morning. I walked back and forth. It was so interesting to me. Uh, but 
I never did catch up with Lee because uh, we know we both knew where we were going, okay. and I was interested in watching the trains. But I did look up to see him walking up the back steps, going into the back of the. the so you uh, watched him long enough to see him going up the back steps because you were walking towards the school book depository, but just a good distance behind. Him. Yes. Okay. So you got to see him as he walked away, and you got to see him intermittently as he was walking, and you got to see him as he's walking up the back steps. Yes. What did you see? Well, he had uh, the package uh, under his armpit. Well, your arm's bent. You, well, you if you had it down by your side. Okay. And then the other end cupped in your hand. And that's the way he carried it. Show me that again. Okay, now, the expanse of my fingers is nine inches. So you're telling me that 18, maybe 24 inches at the most was the length of that package. Well, I, I've often said it's around two feet, give or take an inch too. Okay, so we just said it was around two feet, maybe an inch or two. Yes. No more. That is correct. Was it a rifle? No, absolutely not, because um, I, I worked for a company by the name of History of America Tours for several years, a company owned by Pete Brown uh, here in uh, Dallas. and. Uh, and at one of our History of America tours, matter of fact, the last one we had was right here in the Magnolia Hotel. And uh, my friend Josiah Thompson, some way he purchased a Italian Concardo rifle. A duplicate of what Lee was supposedly using that day. Yes. And um, the one my friend has is uh, the serial number is, is uh, just 25 from the one actually they found on the sixth floor. So we know we're talking about the same uh, size weapon. Uh, one time during a break, he and I measured the stock and we measured the barrel. And he looked at me and he says, you've been telling the truth all along. It would not fit in that package. And it wouldn't fit under your arm. It'd be it'd be sticking up above you, up to your ear at least. Yeah. Yes. And it wasn't it, it it wasn't that. So if Lee Harvey Oswald didn't carry a rifle into the school book depository that morning, and yet if there was a rifle found in the school book depository, did you put it there? No. I didn't put it there. No. How did it get there? I can get the wall. All right. These, these you people to... have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody. No. Sir. You just heard uh, Oswald, who said he did not shoot anybody. I'm being pummeled here. I'm being pummeled very heavily. You just heard Oswald say, I did not shoot anybody. That I do not know. I don't know either. Anything else you want to tell me about November 22nd, 1963, that you can remember as you sit here now, 50 years later? Well, November the 22nd is a day that changed my life. I've never been the same since. And it was the longest day of my life. In fact, when you left the Scoop Up Depository, after the shooting, you walked out on the street. And you were standing on the street and you saw Lee Harvey Oswald again that day, didn't you? I did see Lee Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald after the, the assassination, yes. Where did you see him? Uh, he came down off the back dock. Back that loading dock, the same yeah. loading dock he walked into that morning, yeah. the same loading dock you walked into that yeah. morning. He came off the dock and walked right down beside the building. On Houston Street? Yes. Did he get to the red light? Did he get to the traffic light? Or did yeah. he cross over? Uh, no, he, he did come to the uh, traffic light. And um, someone said something to me when I was standing out there in front of the steps for a few minutes. Uh, and I did see him cross Houston Street. And uh, so I he did. He crossed Houston Street going away from the school book depository. Yes, he's going uh, back up Elm, okay. going east on Elm. And then when he got to the um, Other traffic side light by over by there, the Altex building. yes, he crossed over Elm. Elm. And about halfway across the street, somebody said something to me, and I looked. And when I looked back, he was gone. I don't know where, it, where he went from there. Uh, and then Afterwards, we had a roll call, and at the roll call, he was missing. But as I said, there was uh, sandwich shops. Uh, there was one down in the, what they call now the West End, and there was one around, I think, uh, right there within a block or two of the building there that we worked in. 
Now, you say he was missing from the roll call. Wasn't Charles Gibbons also missing from the roll call? Now, that I don't know. Do you know of anybody else that was missing? Um, the only one that I'm aware of that was not there at the roll call was, um, was Lee. Just Lee. Okay. Did that raise any suspicion, any thoughts in your mind because Lee was not at the roll call? No, because I thought that he had probably walked over to get him a sandwich because that morning on the way to work, I noticed he didn't have his lunch with him. And I asked him and he says, I'm going to buy my lunch today. He said, it's a day I'll never forget in my life because it was the longest day of my life. And you got arrested that day too? Yes, I did. Captain Fritz even questioned you that night. Yes, he did. Captain he Fritz tried to get a confession out of you that you were part of a conspiracy to kill the president. That is correct. <laughs> but wasn't that absurd? Yes. Um, so he put a confession in front of you and wanted you to sign it? He did. And All I, you had to do was sign your name to that. Whether you were pressured, under duress, or not thinking clearly, and you'd, be, you'd have been blamed. You'd have been part of American history being blamed for the same thing that Lee Harvey Oswald got blamed for. Well, that, that uh, I wouldn't want. No. Because, I wouldn't want that either. No. Because it's not true. That is correct. It is not true. But T tried to get me to sign the confession, and I told him I wouldn't sign it. And he drew his hand back to hit me, and I put my arm up like this, because he was standing to my left. And he snatched the paper up. He got real red-faced, snatched the paper up, and walked out. But before he walked out, when I put my arm up the block, and I told him, I said, I know this policeman right to my right here outside the door. But I said, you and I are going to have a hell of a fight. And I said, I'm going to get a couple of good licks in on you. And, that's, and I sometimes wonder. And I don't mean to be ugly or say anything ugly about uh, Captain Will Fritz. Because I wouldn't want his family to think that I, I go around smearing a man's name. But Captain Will Fritz and I could never be friends because of the way he treated me. And it was allowed for me to be treated. Because here I was, a young boy from a small rural area, never been in any trouble, and I just don't understand why they had to treat me that way. You're a brave man. I'm proud to say that I know you.